Have you ever wondered how devices communicate over the air? How they take their data and convert it into the radio waves that then get converted back into the data? In today's video, we're going to talk about that exact process. So actually taking bits, ones, zeros, converting them into radio waves, and then taking those radio waves and converting them back into bits. As a security researcher or somebody who's interested in this stuff, this is going to allow you to see really low levels, you know, analysis of how these devices work and start hacking away on wireless devices, which are increasing with popularity around the world. These kinds of concepts obviously apply to things like the phone that you probably have in your pocket, uh, even street lights out on the streets. Uh, today though, we're gonna be looking at key fobs. So the key fob to my Jeep, just like the key fob that you have to your vehicle, I'm sure parked somewhere, and uh, how those key fobs actually transmit their data to the vehicle and how the vehicle responds to that data. At the end of today's video, you'll have everything you need to start looking at wireless devices. Uh, there's gonna be some fluctuation based on the type of modulation that's going on and that kind of thing. Uh, but all of this kind of stuff is sort of the same in its root principle. And a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about today applies to these different things, regardless of what the modulation is. With that said, I am super passionate about educational outreach and I'm building this channel specifically to target poorly taught concepts, things that took me a long time to learn uh, myself. And so if you could like the video, that would help us get it out to more people, get the algorithm to pick that up, and that would be greatly appreciated. With that said, if this stuff is generally useful or interesting to you at all, please subscribe to the channel for more of it. I'm doing these videos Monday, Wednesday, Friday, typically. And uh, so going you know, forward into the future, if you subscribe, you'll see another video in a few days. Uh, but with that said, turn that like button blue, and let's get into the video. All right, y'all, so we are in a Ubuntu environment here, in a Linux environment. We've got a few pieces of software, and I've got the key fob to my Jeep in front of me. Uh, and so we are going to sort of go through the signal recon process and eventually get the signal back down into hexadecimal information. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to actually detect the signal coming out of this and verify what frequency, what carrier frequency it's on. To do that, the first thing we're going to do before we open the analyzer is we are going to um, verify that our software defined radio is connected. So uh, you could do this with an RTL SDR, a cheap $30 SDR, or you could do something uh, more capabilities. I have a hacker F1 um, sitting next to me on the desk, and we can verify that it's connected with hacker F underscore info. And if it is, we should get uh, found hacker F uh, with an index and serial number. Uh, and so now we know we're going to start capturing information. And now that we have it connected, we're going to open GQRX. That's GQRX. Uh, if you don't have it, you can install it with apt, apt get installed GQRX. And once you have it open, I'll just get that spin up. Um, we're going to mute it. This is very important. If you don't do this, uh, it's going to blow up in your ears because you're going to get the signal coming through um, in the audible range as well. And essentially, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to figure out what the carrier frequency of this this device is. So, what, um, regardless of the modulation, what the sort of center frequency is. And to do this, you can go to the FCC website and try to look up FCC IDs for the devices. A lot of the times. Uh, a lot of the time, this will be on a sticker on the back of the device. However, with key fobs, generally they are not. Uh, you can sometimes find them. There are typically a few frequencies that these will be on. And in this case, I know that the signal is going to be somewhere around 440. And this will typically change a little bit, uh, specifically for this device, will change a little bit uh, sort of occurrence to occurrence. But we can at least start at 440. And if we need to move it around a little bit, we can do that. Um, so you can just punch this in or use your mouse wheel to adjust it. Make sure you're muted and then you can hit play and you'll see your noise floor around like, uh, what is that, 85 decibels or something? Uh, negative 85 decibels. Um, we got a, a few signals around us that are, are coming in, um, but we care about the signal coming out of this device. So I'm gonna press the, the key and you'll see the signal come in and you'll see it's gonna be off a little bit. So we're gonna unlock the vehicle and I'm just gonna hold it down. So when I hold it down, you see we start to get a signal in here. We let go of it. Signal, no more signal. Uh, we could do something else. We could do like um, vehicle start. Same kind of thing, comes in here, let it go, no more. Uh, and so we're seeing it's it's around here. It's like 534 maybe. Um, we can verify this with a mess wheel. So we could just like kind of scroll down. So if I go 534 and then do it again, see, we pretty much know it. So now we know what the carrier frequency is and we can move into the next step, which is actually capturing the signal that's coming off this into a file. Okay, so now that we've got our carrier frequency identified, we're gonna go and capture the uh, input into a file so that we can do our analysis. And we're gonna open uh, a tool called GNU Radio. I'll clear this out so we can recreate it again. So we've got GNU Radio open in a YouTube.grc file. And the first thing we need to do in here is we need to set our sample rate. So we need to tell our software-defined radio 
how many samples to take every second. Uh, in our case, we're going to use the maximum sample rate of our SDR. Uh, for me, that's 20 mega samples a second, and that's going to be set in this variable here. Um, upsampling makes this a little bit weird. Quite frankly, I don't understand a lot of the science behind upsampling. Uh, so you can go look that up uh, yourself, and I'm sure you'll, you'll find a lot of resources on that. Uh, Nyquist theorem tells us that we want twice the uh, maximum frequency as our samples. Um, and so in theory, I believe this would make it 800 mega samples a second, and upsampling somehow downgrades that uh, to some lower value. In my case, I'm just going to set a maximum sample rate of 20 mega samples a second, and that should give us enough, uh, basically, granularity. So it's going to make the signal uh, clear enough that we can actually do something. Once we have our sample rate set, we're going to go and start dragging in uh, components, and we can hit Control F to search for one. We want an Osmocom, Osmocom source. Drag that in, and we need to double click on this, and we're going to set our center frequency here. So the center frequency we found before was 434E6, I believe. So 434 um, megahertz, and that looks good. We're going to hit apply. You'll notice it's red because it's not connected to anything, so we need to connect it to something. And we're going to connect it to a QT, uh, QT GUI water, uh, water ball sink. So this guy right here. And this is, this is going to look like what we saw in GQRX. And then we just drag it to connect it, and you'll see it turns black when we do that uh, because we fixed that problem. And on the waterfall sink, uh, we want to do the same thing. We want to set a center frequency of 434, 6. And now um, when we actually view this, it should it should come right through in the center. We want to adjust it. Hit okay. OK. And everything looks good. I'm going to go ahead and reset the SDR just to make sure we're all set. Uh, just a button on the uh, on the hacker up here. And with that said, we're going to go and hit the play button to run the graph. Now this looks very similar to what we saw before. We've got a waterfall sync uh, that it looks exactly like what we had in GQRX. And when I press the unlock button, you should see some data come up in the center here. I'm going to press it, and we've got our blips here. Uh, just like that, easy enough. We can select an area to zoom in on it and do that again. Easy enough. Uh, however, this obviously isn't very helpful. Right? We don't really care that uh, we're capturing you know, things in the water, waterfall sync. We already did that. We want to actually save it to a file. So we're also going to go and grab a file sync. Drag that on. And connect it. Oops. And then we're going to go and edit this. We're going to make this a specific file output. So we'll go to desktop YouTube. Capture. We'll just call it capture. And then we are going to not select append, file, uh, append the file, or it's going to get massive uh, if we do this multiple times. And we're going to go and just hit apply. And now we should have everything we need to capture this to a file. I'm going to reset the SDR one more time to make sure we're all good to go. Sometimes there's some bugs in GNU. Uh, it's just good to do that before you go run. And when we do this, it's going to capture that data to, to this file. However, because our sample rate is 20 mega samples a second, this file is going to get enormous really quick, so I want to do this really fast. I want to start it, capture it, and then close it um, so that we don't generate more data than we need to and generate more things we have to look at. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do this really close to the antenna just to get maximum clarity here. I don't know if it matters. Sometimes you get better results if you do that. But um, you'll see it on the graph. We're going to open it, uh, press the button, and then close it. So here we go. And that should basically be it. So now we should have a file. If we go uh, back to the terminal and look in the directory, uh, we should have a capture file. And this should just be binary, uh, binary file. And it is. It's just data. And so now that we have our file captured, we can go ahead and start the inspection, start using Inspectrum to look at what's actually going on. Right. So like I said, we are going to now open Inspectrum um, and use Inspectrum to analyze this file. Um, so we can do this. You can just apt install uh, Inspectrum. Uh, I already have it installed, so I'll just run Inspectrum like that. And this is what it looks like. Uh, so we put our sample right in here, and then we're going to open a capture. And we'll go back to the capture we got. So this, this file here, you can see it generated half a gigabyte in that little blip of time that we had. Uh, a lot of data, a lot of data. And so open that up, and you'll see, you can barely see it here, but we got a little blue. Um, it, we can adjust the FFT size. Uh, to change how big this is. And we want it to be a little bit smaller because we're going to have a few of these coming up in a second. So the first thing we're going to do is just adjust our power minimums and maximums to all the way open so that we can make sure we actually capture data. And we'll use our scroll button or a scroll bar at the bottom to, to see the signal. And notice we, we did capture data. Um, 
And I can tell you, just because I've done this before, that this is a Manchester encoded uh, OOK wave, so on off keying. And that means that uh, a 1 is represented with a, a signal, a 0 is represented with no signal, so nothing at all, rather than ASK, which would have a small amount of signal. And Manchester encoded means that there's not going to be more than two ones or two zeros in a row. And we'll put this through a Manchester decoder, uh, decoder in a little bit so you can see what that looks like. Now that we've identified uh, the signal itself, we want to zoom in a little bit. So we're going to do control and mouse wheel in to get in a little bit on this. And this is, this is the signal. So it came through really clear. This looks great. Uh, we can adjust our power minimum up a little bit to isolate the signal a little bit. We don't need all of it. And that's looking, it's looking pretty decent to me like that. Um, and so the first thing we're going to do here, now that we have the signal isolated, is we are going to right click, add a derived plot, and then we are going to add a sample plot here. And we get this uh, selection area at the top. And this, this is going to be used to isolate the carrier frequency. So we're going to drag this down into the carrier and we'll have to line this up as close as we can. You'll see as we do this, um, the bottom piece changes a little bit, right? So we get it right on top, we'll be good, and then we can drag this uh, component at the top out or in, and it should isolate the signal for us. And now if it doesn't, we need to adjust our power, min power minimums and maximums. And you'll see as we do this, we're going to start isolating that signal down. So when we drag the power maximum out, um, now we pretty much have on and off, on and off, on and off. And this simple plot is going to allow us to start isolating that signal down even more and eventually pull the bits out. So from the sample plot, we're going to right click it, add a drive plot, and add an amplitude plot. And now you can see what we're talking about. We're getting a, a very clear on and off. However, it's not perfect. You got a little bit of noise down here. And if we zoom all the way in, you'll see, kind of hard to tell, we've actually got a leading edge here. It's not just a straight up and down. We do have a leading edge. Um, so this is actually, this is not binary. It's, it's still a signal. And in order to finish things off, we're going to right click on this, add a derive plot, and add a threshold plot. And now this is a perfect on and off uh, signal here. So once we have our threshold plot, see we've gone through this whole process, we can now uh, pull out the bits. Pull out the bits, we are going to check this box that says enable cursor and drag it to the leading edge and drag the back to the edge of that first sample. And then it's going to start giving its measurements. It's going to try to tell us what the, what the sample rate is and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, how many samples a second we're getting, that kind of, or not samples a second, how many uh, bits a second we're getting. Uh, and so we select that first one, and then we want to start increasing it. So we'll say like, let's start with uh, 10 samples. We want to make sure this is nice and lined up. Looks like we're pretty good already. Uh, we'll zoom out, we'll make this 50 samples. And we want to make sure it's lined up over here. Drag this in a little bit. It's good. And we're basically just trying to get it perfectly aligned with the, uh, with the sample as it came in. And so we've got this, and now I'm going to go all the way to the end. We'll increase this to like 256, uh, for example, right? Six gets all the way to the end, and let's see here. It's a little bit annoying. Got to line it up here. Looks pretty good. And then before we finish, I'm going to just go back to the beginning and drag kind of like a a leading edge a little bit here, all right? Just in case we got like a leading. You guys wouldn't have a leading zero, but maybe um, some data gets picked up here or something. It's just good practice. And so now that we've done this. Um, we've isolated our bits and we're ready to pull them out. And we can right click it, uh, extract symbols, and say extract them to standard out. And if we go back to our terminal where we started in Spectrum, we have our ones and zeros. And so it's, it's, it's really that simple. Now I told you guys I was going to show you uh, the other components of it, uh, of actually getting the data back to what it, what it was originally transmitted at. So technically it was transmitted uh, like these ones and zeros. This is what was modulated uh, into the OOK wave. But uh, I want to show you that you know, the Manchester data is actually Manchester data, so you're not just seeing ones and zeros, and you're like, what are you talking about? Um, you can see there's a couple ones in a row here, there's a zero, one, et cetera. Um, this, is, this key fob will start by sending one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, uh, sort of as a, as a reset code from what I can tell, and then it will send your data. So this looks like it is a data packet, but we need to bring it back to uh, the Manchester encoded version of that, uh, or non-Manchester encoded version. So we're gonna right click, extract symbols, copy to clipboard, and now we have those ones and zeros on our clipboard. We need to do something with them. So I'm gonna open Firefox, and we're gonna Google, I'm just gonna use an online tool for this, make it a little bit easier for us. Uh, and I'm gonna search Manchester encoder, or decoder, online. I'm gonna spell it right. 
and uh, decode.fr has generally got a bunch of these. And now we can paste our ones and zeros, or actually we have to get rid of all this noise first, so I'll just open Adam and do this. File, um, file, replace, nothing, find all, replace all, now we've got ones and zeros, and we can bring that to Firefox, we'll go ahead and paste that in. And now you can see basically what we captured, so it measured between, the back inspector, it measured between these lines, it was like, this is a one, this is zero, this is a one, this is zero. Uh, and, it, and it gave that to us. So if we go back to Firefox, we do line decoding, um, and it gets us the result. And so one zero, one zero, one zero. Last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show tune hacks, like I said. So uh, we're gonna go to CyberChef. Now we've got the Manchester decoded version of these bits. And you'll notice that that's real because we've got more than one, one in a row or more than one zero in a row. Um, but we wanna convert from binary, to hex, and this will become very clear um, this data. So binary to hex, and you can kind of see what's going on. So we've got um, this F byte at the front that always seems to be F, and then we've got FE37C3, uh, which is always uh, the key fob ID. Uh, I believe it's these three bytes, and potentially even four bytes. We haven't, haven't completely reversed this key fob before. Um, and then if I remember correctly, it's the next two bytes are uh, your command code, and then one, two, three, four, five, six are your um, rolling code. So it's one, two, three, four. Uh, yeah, I believe. So it's the first four bytes is the key fob ID, the next four bytes is the command code, and the last four bytes is the rolling code. So as you send new signals, um, the rolling code increases, and that's your encryption that actually verifies that what's coming out of the key fob um, is synced up with the vehicle. Uh, and that can be using a protocol like Keylock or something else. Um, but regardless, that encryption is, a, is actually what's securing the connection. Because um, obviously anybody can go and read this, we just did, right? Uh, and quite frankly, anybody can go and transmit this too. So the security of the key fob relies on this rolling code being secure. And yeah, that's basically all there is to it. Uh, this is going to vary a little bit depending on the wave you're looking at. It could be, um, you know, on-off keying. In this case, it might be ASK encoded in a different case where you have um, a, a high value here instead of nothing but a carrier. Um, you can see that up here a little bit clearer. Uh, it could be an FSK encoded um, wave, you know, like frequency shift keyed, or rather than amplitude shift keyed. And actually, the proximity lock on the vehicles on the Jeeps are, uh, are FSK. So it just depends on what you're doing. But this is the, the core principle of signals reconnaissance. And I hope that you guys got something out of it. Thank you guys for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. If you found this useful, please like it so the algorithm picks it up and we get it out to more people who are also interested in this kind of stuff. I do videos like these a few times a week, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And uh, so if you found this useful, subscribe and there's definitely going to be more of it coming out soon. Uh, with that said though, thanks for watching. I will see you guys in a few days.